All right. Yes. Um, well, thanks for joining us. Um, we are going to talk about how to become a language teacher, and we've kept that um, uh, fairly open um, uh, for a reason. So this is aimed for people who are interested in uh, teaching foreign languages, as well as teaching English as a foreign language. And we're going to talk about um, both a little bit uh, today. Um, and it's, it's a joint event uh, by um, uh, the Department for Modern Languages and English Language um, and, and Linguistics. Um, there is obviously, with both degrees, a variety of careers um, that um, students aspire to, uh, that graduates uh, take on. Uh, we have um, alumni who work in banking, in marketing, uh, in software startups, who have founded their own business. But there is always um, a lot of our graduates um, who go on uh, to become teachers, language teachers um, 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 of different uh, sorts. And um, that's probably because if you are interested in languages, in language and linguistics, there is a social element in there. You probably, um, you probably enjoy working with people. Um, um, it's also something quite academic, I would say. Um, and and all, um, ultimately, um, there's probably also this curiosity for, for languages and, and cultures that um, drives people to um, study um, um, uh, both fields in the first place, and then perhaps also to carry on continuing um, this um, enthusiasm and pass it on to others um, as, as teachers. Um, in a similar way, um, I believe our audience today is very uh, mixed. So some of you uh, might be currently studying um, for the um, A-levels and considering um, uh, where to um, continue after that, um, uh, whether you want to study at your university and if so, which one um, to choose and which field. Um, some of you um, are currently uh, students, some of you at the University of Kent and perhaps interested um, in careers in teaching and this event um, is meant um, uh, for all of you. And similarly, our speakers today um, come from a variety of career stages. So we have um, uh, two um, lecturers um, here at the University of uh, Kent with us. There is Dr. Uh, Gloria uh, Chamorro. Did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> Good enough. Okay, thank you. She is lecturer in applied linguistics. Um, and Dr. Vicia Ferrucci, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, both my Spanish and Italian um, uh, is not very far developed. Uh, she is the director of the university's language center. Um, but both of them are also involved um, in uh, training our students um, in a variety of ways to become uh, teachers um, in the future. Um, we're also joined by two of our um, current students, uh, Rebecca Allen, um, who is a final year student in Hispanic Studies, and Rachel Etherington, um, who studies English language and linguistics and uh, German. And they will speak um, a little bit about their experience um, um, as uh, British Council teaching assistants during the year abroad. And in the case of um, Rachel, she will also speak about um, an initiative um, that was um, uh, created by uh, Vicia, um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Ogden, who is a lecturer in Hispanic studies, um, and me, the online language mentoring scheme where students, current students at the University of Kent mentor secondary uh, school uh, students online, support them uh, in studying a language, a foreign language uh, towards GCSE and A-levels. And then there is uh, Ana Maria uh, Grant. Um, she um, graduated earlier this year with a degree in Hispanic studies and Italian, is now uh, doing a PGCE or studying towards a PGCE um, in languages at the University of Exeter. And there is uh, Robert Wilcock, um, who teaches um, Spanish, I believe, is that correct? Um, at uh, the Barton Court Grammar School uh, here in Canterbury. 
It's a long list of speakers. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I've asked them uh, in preparation to just um, take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about their perspective on uh, language learning, on uh, language teaching, um, about uh, the role that the University of Kent can play here, but also about their experience um, in careers um, that involve um, teaching. And after that, um, we have um, plenty of time for questions, for a discussion. So anything that you would like to know about how to become a language teacher, today is your day. Um, Gloria, do you want to start? Oh, there we go. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. So you're going to share the um, slides for me, right, Tobias? OK, perfect. Well, well um, oh, we're getting them now. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Loretta Morra, as you can see on the screen, and I am a lecturer in applied linguistics, as Tobia mentioned before. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is the modules that we have within the BA in English Language and Linguistics that deal with uh, language teaching and language learning, and also some of the opportunities that we offer our students uh, with regards to language teaching. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the area that I teach in uh, within uh, the BA in English Language and Linguistics is called Applied Linguistics, uh, which I guess uh, we can say it deals with uh, applying linguistics to the real world. And one of those applications is the teaching uh, of languages, okay, foreign languages. So we have a few modules uh, that are on language uh, teaching and um, the learning of languages. Uh, in stage two or year two, uh, we have a module called Learning and Teaching Languages. And um, this module covers both the learning of languages and the teaching of languages. So the first half of the module, um, you cover topics um, like second language acquisition. Um, we deal with phenomena like bilingualism and um, things like code switching, which is re re related to bilingualism. We'd cover um, individual difference factors like motivation, for example, or age uh, or personality and how those affect the learning of languages. Um, and then the second half of the module is about the teaching of languages. So we talk about different teaching methods, uh, different contexts in which languages are taught or learned and how we apply different techniques, for example, depending on the context. Um, and this module is both uh, theoretical, but also experimental and very practical. Okay, so um, we also look at uh, data from real language learners and we look at um, some of the errors they make and where those errors may come from. Um, we'll look at, um, as I said, things like code switching, um, different cross-linguistic influence from one language to the other. Okay, um, so that's stage two. Um, and then we have English language teaching one and two, which happen in year three. So English language teaching one takes place in the autumn term and English language teaching two takes place in the spring term. So that's the continuation of the module. And so these modules um, are, in particular about the teaching of English as a second foreign language. Okay, the same way that learning and teaching languages is a general uh, module about learning and teaching languages. The other two are about the teaching of English in particular as a second or foreign language. So here we talk about things like lesson planning, classroom organization. Um, we talk about teaching the different areas of a language, uh, vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, um, which are specific for English, right? Uh, we talk about teaching the skills, um, speaking, listening, uh, reading and writing, and teaching different uh, profile of students, different materials that could be used. We talk about assessment, feedback. Um, and in this module, you kind of get a taster of becoming a language teacher, right? So you get to plan a lesson, a language lesson. Um, you have to teach a lesson, and then you get the chance to observe and evaluate uh, your own lesson, okay? So it's kind of like a mini taster of what being a language teacher looks like. Um, and then we often have also guest speakers um, that are expert in some of the areas that we cover in this module. And they talk about their experience. Uh, for example, one of them um, that we often have, it talks about English for specific purposes, which is a big market at the moment. There's a lot of jobs in this area. Um, we also have guest speakers talking about testing, assessment, which is also an important area of um, language teaching, as you know. Okay, I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so the previous modules were specific about um, second language um, 
the acquisition of second languages or the teaching of second languages, but we also have modules that are somewhat related as well. So in year two, there is a module that um, deals with first language acquisition, okay, with the acquisition of um, children acquiring their first language in terms of the phonology, the morphology, semantics, syntax, pragmatics, um, from a theoretical but also experimental perspective. And then in year three, there is a module called um, language in atypical circumstances that deals with language development um, in populations that have some disorder or uh, impairment. So for example, we talk about um, sign language, um, aphasias, um, uh, populations that have specific language impairments or Williams syndrome, Down syndrome, autism, and how the language develops um, in these different populations. Okay, I'm done with that one. Okay, so those are the modules that we offer um, within the BA of English, Lang uh, English Language and Linguistics that are about um, learning languages. Um, and then we also have some opportunities for our students to teach um, English, okay? So one of the opportunities that we offer is within a, a project that is called the English Hub for Refugees. So this is a project that um, helps refugees and migrants um, to gain the English language skills they need to, on the one hand, integrate into the community, but also access mainstream education and jobs. And we do this um, by two main activities. One of them is um, we offer weekly English classes at the University of Kent. Um, for an accompanied refugee minors. Okay, so those minors come to the university and then they receive English classes. And then we also develop language learning materials for, mag for migrants. Um, and so our students are the ones that do this. Okay, so if you were to get involved in this project, you would teach those uh, minors, of course, with the support and the training that you need. Um, and then you can also get involved in developing some of these materials. Um, I've added the website in case you're interested in having a look at what the project looks like, some of the pictures that we have, uh, the materials. You could see the materials that we have for each of the levels of proficiency. Um, okay. And the last slide um, is about other opportunities that we um, offer our students. Um, so we have students that have gone into doing uh, teaching assistantship with some of the institutions that we have collaborations with. So one of those institutions is called Tactopia and Company, which is in Japan. And so we've had students gone uh, during their winter program and also the summer program, which is about two weeks um, and teach English there. And then we've also had students going to uh, a university in Spain, Cadiz University, which is in the south of Spain. And this is for students who finish their BA and the, they go after their third year uh, because it's for a whole year. Okay, so we've had students going for a year to teach there uh, as well. And then other students who, um, as they've volunteered for the English Hub, became interested in, in volunteering and wanted to further uh, that experience, they've gone and um, volunteer at some of the um, local institutions or charities that we collaborate with. And one of these is, uh, for example, Camp Refugee Action Network. Okay, so there's also uh, opportunities for volunteering um, to teach English to, um, in this case, refugees as well. Okay, and that's all uh, from me. Okay, thank you very much, Gloria. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's already um, a few questions uh, that people might have, but please keep them for later. Um, okay. Visya, um, uh, would you say a few words about um, uh, what we do in modern languages to kind of kind of mirror um, um, what Gloria talked about um, in English language and linguistics? With pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint because I've been in meetings that lasted for hours. So to avoid my own death by PowerPoint, I have decided to just give some sort of spontaneous talk and to ask a former student of mine to describe this module for me. So I will introduce it first, and then I will ask Anna Maria to jump in and give you a little bit of uh, perspective on it, uh, since she's doing a PGCE. So it will be useful to see how the module perhaps helped her maybe, I hope, to embark on her career. I'm not suggesting anything there. I'm just throwing words. So languages in the classroom uh, is the title of the module and I'm going to pop it in the, um, in the chat. 
is a very interactive module for students in stage three. So most of them will have returned from their year abroad. Uh, and this module introduces students to the magical world of language teaching or uh, wants to consolidate their teaching experiences. Uh, during our classes, we go over crucial theoretical perspectives uh, of language pedagogy, but we dedicate a lot of space and time to teaching uh, put in practice with uh, open discussions and uh, group uh, exercises. Um, so I'm not afraid to put my own practices in discussion if this is what you're wondering. Not that I like it, but the, it's, it's anything goes. So um, during this module, students are uh, warmly encouraged to participate as observers and even as language assistants in our own language modules in stage one, hence gaining a bit of practical experience in teaching modern languages in higher education whilst completing their own degree. Uh, so in class, what we do is that we then discuss what they have seen uh, and how they have interacted both with the teacher and with the students. The assessment components of this module include uh, a theoretical as well as a practical element. The practical element is, as well as in glorious modules, a, ma a micro teaching. So the students are asked to plan a class and to deliver it to their own peers in their target language or a language of their choice and they are assigned a mentor for it, which is usually a lector or a language trainee, so that they can prepare this class with somebody who's more experienced than them, but who's not necessarily a bore such as myself. So uh, this session, this micro teaching is usually very much enjoyed by students and also by myself because I get to learn more languages and it gives the opportunity to develop uh, one's language skills further. So it's not just about language uh, teaching, but it is also about practicing your own language, uh, your own uh, second language. Um, so in short, this is a very practical module that gives concrete skills as well as some theoretical background uh, knowledge, which is very helpful, I hope for those who will go on and, for instance, do a PGCE, whilst also providing students with the opportunity to see if teaching is an avenue they would like to explore or not in the future. Uh, this year, for instance, we will be focusing a lot on the use of technology in the classroom. Obviously, this year is going to be languages in the virtual classroom. And uh, we will also have a few guest speakers uh, uh, um, who are experts in their field of uh, language teaching. One will be delivering, for, for the instance, a lecture on using music to teach grammar and so forth. I spoke way too much. Anna Maria, if you want to say something about this module, thank you very much. Yeah, so I took the module last year while um... I was in my last year and it was a very enjoyable module. It was my favorite one that I took throughout the whole year. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, um, I didn't really know what to expect. I read obviously what it would entice and everything, but I didn't know what, to, what I would expect. You don't really know until you set foot in the classroom. And it was very much a very relaxed, but also very productive atmosphere. And I really enjoyed that. Um, you go through everything you need to know um, to prepare you to be entering the world of teaching. I found it really useful because at the time I was doing um, this module, I had my interview as well to get into Exeter. And that really helped me because I could talk about all the aspects or some of the aspects that we covered whilst doing the module, which really helped boost my own knowledge of the how to teach and everything and they seemed quite impressed by that because I got in and I'm doing it now um, and it also helps you whilst you're doing it as well because you talk about a lot about assessment a lot about theories and how to teach and um, everything is covered in this little module it's a sort of introduction 
because you are you are allowed to go into more detail based on what you want to do for your written assignment so you can do that of course um but it's it's a bit of an introduction and it prepares you for what the a pgc course might um uh oh my god what is the word in english sorry i it happens a lot um yeah, i forgot now um it just it helps you prepare for the course and uh, so I'm doing mine now. And it was for the first nine weeks or so, it was very, very intense, um, covering all the basis of assessments, how to teach, motivation in the classroom, everything that you might encounter. And if I hadn't done this module previously, I would have found it very, very difficult to get my head around all of the topics that we were covering because it's very intense and it's they're supposed to finish the theoretical side of things before you go into actually practicing and doing your placements i finished my two weeks before christmas and i was able to discuss uh, a lot with the teachers that were in school with me now before christmas and i was pleasantly surprised by the fact that i knew what i was saying um from my time spent in Kent that I things that I remembered from that module. So I would recommend it very much to anyone who wants to become a teacher or is interested in trying it out because it really does set up everything for you. And it's very, very helpful for the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna Maria and, and Vicia. It's really, um, it's really good to hear um, such a success story um, and, 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 and that you did find um, uh, the module helpful for what you're doing right now. Um, and now we have uh, uh, Becky Allen and uh, Rachel Etherington. Um, Becky, do you want to say a few words about uh, your year abroad um, and uh, working as an English language teaching assistant uh, via the British Council? Yeah, yeah. So um, I obviously it was a bit different last year because of coronavirus, but um, I ended up spending five and a half months in a town called Reus in Spain. It's near to Tarragona, so about an hour and a bit from Barcelona. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. I also want to go into teaching. So I knew straight away that like the British Council was what I wanted to do when you get to choose what you want to do for your year abroad. Um, and I literally, I just loved it. It was probably, yeah, one of the best experiences of my life. Um, not to sound cliche or anything, <laughs> but it's just nice to be able to do something completely different, kind of related to what you want to do in the future, but it's still relevant to your degree. Um, and as a single on a Hispanic studies student in second year, we started a Catalan module. So then that also really helped when I then moved to Catalonia because otherwise I probably wouldn't have understood anything. Um, but it meant I was kind of able to improve my Spanish and my Catalan at the same time, which I'm very grateful for. It's helped a lot this year as well. Um, but also just in terms of teaching, you, you, I think I was working 12 hours a week or 13 hours a week. So it's kind of you eased into it almost. It's like just a little bit of a taste. And a lot of the time the teachers give you something to do sometimes they ask you they're like oh can you help so my school did and um, they have like project-based learning so all the years would do a specific project and they do these projects about like science or maths but in English and it was just fascinating just being able to work on that as well because it's just it was very different to my school experience so yeah I just really enjoyed it Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, Rachel, um, you've worked um, as uh, an English language assistant as well, but you've also um, joined our mentoring scheme. Um, I don't know um, which one, uh, which one of the experiences you want to start with, whether there is any connections between the two. Um, I'll try and work in a connection. <laughs> um, so I did my year, my year abroad in Germany um, and yeah, I loved it as well, same as Becky. Um, I found it a lot, so there were a lot of challenges, obviously, when you're first out there, and there was a lot of aspects of teaching in a classroom that I wasn't expecting to be faced with, and I was. For example, I was um, tasked with a lot of small groups. You take out small groups with a class, um, and you practice their speaking skills, um, and a lot of the time, 
uh, for the first time, I had to work with children with learning difficulties and um, that needed more attention than the rest of the class. Or I was um, in, uh, there were a lot of children from migrant families. So they, were, they, they didn't speak German either. So that was really difficult trying to like teach English through a language that they also didn't speak. So it was kind of like a pantomime, like um, kind of sign language English all in one. So that was just a really interesting experience. And after that, I really started to um, consider not only a career in teaching, but also a career in teaching um, children with learning difficulties, which has really helped this year because I'm doing the atypical uh, language English and uh, in module in English this year so that's really helping with um, that kind of career avenue um, but yeah this year as well um, I'm also doing the online mentoring scheme so in Germany I was teaching kind of 10 year olds to 16 year olds whereas this year online I'm teaching college kids um, who are doing German um, and that's a really I wanted to do it just because I know the jump from GCSE to a level in German was so big for me and I found that asking the the my mentorees now they're finding the exact same um, and I thought um, if I was in a level and I got offered the, offered the opportunity to have this speaking session once a week with a almost fluent um, German speaker then I would have just jumped at the chance so I just thought I would help them because I would have loved to have that help when I, if I was them um, but yeah that's kind of a completely different experience to Germany obviously because it's the, my uh, not my native language now so it's even scarier I'm scared I'm going to make mistakes and they'll call me out in it hasn't happened yet thank god um but yeah it's just really um it's really fun um trying to find a, a, a topic of conversation that's gonna help them but also they're gonna find interesting um and yeah uh, it's really rewarding kind of seeing themselves correct themselves on things that you've you've pulled them up on before so you can actually see them learning even though it's just one hour a week so it's really really like it's emphasized so much that that's what I want to do um in the future so yeah it's just it's really good I find fantastic fantastic thank you very much Rachel um it's really great to hear um all these different stories about your experiences with teaching and and kind of uh it always already gives a bit of an impression of the different varieties and facets that teaching uh, entails, the challenges that you face, but then also um, all the uh, rewarding elements. Um, yes, we've already heard from um, Ana Maria, uh, one of our recent graduates, and, and uh, Robert. Um, um, I don't know exactly when you graduated, um, but um, uh, you also have the PGCE behind you and have already been teaching for a few years now, haven't you? Yeah, hello. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes. yes, hi everyone. Yeah, so I graduated from Kent in the summer of 2015 um, and then I went straight into doing a PGCE. Um, I'm glad to um, call on the experiences of a couple of the other speakers as well. So I um, did a year abroad. Uh, luckily, I was lucky enough to get a full year abroad. Um, I did my uh, assistantship in France working in a, a lycée in France, which was fantastic. And then I also did uh, the languages in the classroom model as well and I can only concur with um, everyone else's thoughts that those two experiences were the perfect um, sort of precursor to the qualification that for me was the PGCE. And what's really nice nowadays is that there are so many different routes into teaching so some you know the more, more traditional route is PGCE um, which is the postgraduate certificate in education um, where you will have experience in schools the theoretical side as has, has been mentioned um, by Anna Maria and uh, there are other ways as well at some places um, at certain academy trusts um, offer their own initial te teacher training which are known as ITT some some of them call it SKIT uh, and you can get into those routes there's also school direct where you are uh, pretty quickly responsible for your own classes so there's loads of different ways depending on what um, you know potential student teachers are interested in doing so i've been working um, in Kent, uh, schools for about four years now um, i did one year at Raynham school for girls which was a non-selective uh, secondary school um, in medway 
and I now work at Barkingport Grammar School, which is, I hasten to add, also my old secondary school as well. So I'm probably the, the, the least travelled MFL teacher. I've come straight back round again. But, you know, um, I, what I thought I'd discuss with you is just, you know, with the, the process for me and some top tips for people who, who want to get into teaching and, what and, you know, sort of, dare I say, what it takes uh, to be a languages teacher as well, which I'm sure um, everyone here has got. Um, so, you know, long term for me, looking at things like work experience, it's, we're very lucky in the Canterbury area to be blessed with lots and lots and lots of schools. Um, obviously, it's a bit harder at the moment to get into schools with the coronavirus, etc. But definitely keep your eye out for any potential placements. We're always looking for more people. So I'll put that as a personal plea. If there are any potential um, students who want to get involved in uh, sort of uh, assistantships and work experience, we can put a whole programme together for that because um, we obviously have uh, quite a lot of experience in the teaching and learning side and we can offer mentoring for that like, as well. Then as well for me, um, I was then able to, I, I, I worked at Rome School for Girls in, as an NQT, newly qualified teacher, when you are supported through that initial stage of, of getting used to what a teacher is, a slightly reduced timetable, um, and, and I, during that year I was also able to become the UCAS coordinator of that school as well, and I'll talk a bit more about opportunities uh, within the teaching profession a bit later. Um, but, you know, for me, what, what, what does MFL or, you know, modern foreign languages teaching, what does it represent, certainly in the secondary sector, um, there's an, a real desperate need for more languages teachers up and down the country. So there's a definite, I, I'll, I'll put that plea out to everyone now, if you're thinking about doing it, you desperately need enthusiastic, dedicated and creative um, individuals to get into the world of teaching. Um, as well, you know, there's no question that you need to have real dedication, have real resilience. Yeah, teaching in secondary school is not an easy thing to do, and it, we could be under no illusions there. It, you know, it can take over your life, but in, in the best possible way. You know, the students I work with on a daily basis, I feel really, really um, privileged to be working with them and to be supporting them to help them gain real life qualifications. And that's what it's all about. It's about the impact that we have on a daily basis and those sort of light bulb moments. Um, and, and that's really important, you know, that with the new Oxford framework, there's a bigger emphasis than ever on student well-being and mental health. And that's absolutely a part of, even as a language teacher, we discuss issues um, as part of all our courses that include the environment, the world around us. We deal with really sensitive topics like racism and immigration by the time they come to us for A-level. Um, and as well, something that's been really enjoyable for me, um, and I, I know we've talked about this previously the, this evening, it's the idea of being reflective and, and, and open to new ideas. And I think that languages teachers have to really be on, on the ball with that side of things to motivate and encourage and challenge students. Um, and we've taken, at my school, we've taken a, a research-based approach to how we teach languages. So at the moment, there's, there's one chap who's particularly popular in the language teaching world, which is Gianfranco Ponti. Um, I don't know if he's ever come across um, any of, on any of your courses uh, at Kent. He's particularly good at dealing with the cognitive load of, of the teaching languages and making, um, you know, he chunks words. And he uses a fantastic range of uh, techniques to embed structures in students' long-term memory, which is also a very key important part of what, um, you know, certain official bodies such as Ofsted and observers will be looking for, someone who's able to embed those structures long-term. Um, and that's what gives students confidence and the resilience to enjoy language learning and see it as something positive. And that really is the fundamentals for me as to why a language teacher is somebody who gives students the chance to see how well they can do. Um, so obviously, I mean, I, I wrote down a couple of notes. What, what does MFL teaching look like? Is there a typical day? Well, there are certain strands which I can certainly talk about. Um, I currently teach about 37 hours because I'm also head of year 12 and careers coordinator for, for my school as well. So I get sort of a reduced timetable for that. Typically um, in a fortnightly timetable, I teach about 45 hours in about 11 and 13 classes. If you see that I see my key stage three about three times a fortnight. Um, teachers who aren't ahead of year like me will, you know, they'll typically see their, their tutor groups in the morning. Um, you'll, you'll obviously have between about three and five period days, typically, some schools have more or less. Um, you've got your user responsibilities that we're all used to, things like marking, calling parents, having those uh, positive chats, attending meetings, parents' evenings, obviously not at the moment, everything's gone virtual. Um, and I've written down as well this idea, especially in my line of work, not only are no two classes the same, 
also that uh, the key stages, key stage three, four and five are so totally unique as well. And you need to be the fun and games with key stage three, be a little bit more right and, and a bit more sort of uh, down to earth than the key stage four groups. And then by key stage five, you really have to develop that um, understanding of, of their maturity and how they learn and how they want to learn as well. In a slightly more broad sense, I thought I'd mention as well the sort of different avenues, because obviously MFL teaching is the, still the biggest part of my job. And there's so many different things you can do within teaching. So, for example, there's the curriculum side of things where you can do things like be head of subject, um, head of a, a language or head of department in, in charge of several languages. Uh, you can explore the uh, special and ed educational needs route, whether that be a special special school or whether that be within Senko roles within school. And um, I've explored the pastoral care side most. So I'm head of year, so I'm in charge of everyone who um, is in year 12 currently. And then I, I progress, uh, the academic progress in all subjects, and I look at their their well-being and, and attendance, et cetera. So I keep, I keep myself very busy. Um, if I could offer some, some top tips for people thinking about getting into my line of work, which obviously I absolutely adore, I love my job, um, you know, have good connections, make good connections while you can. Don't be afraid to contact a school. Just if, if, if there's an email address for a colleague or if there is a, an office um, email address, get in touch with a school and ask for advice especially in the local Canterbury area. We'd be very happy to receive local uh, students because uh, we've got a very rigorous risk assessment, which obviously we can explore. Um, obviously not at the moment in tier three, but we hope in the future. And work experience is key, having that experience, um, observing a range of contexts. I'm largely grammar school experience, but having that non-selective route, especially in Kent is really important. Um, knowing the specifications, things like GCSE and A-level, that's really good if you're going for a PGC interview to be able to talk about how you would teach a specific topic. And as well, something else to offer. If you've ever played a musical instrument, I don't know if anyone's done the recorder at some point between now and, and you know, in the last five years, whatever it is you've got, offer something else and it will certainly be appealing to a potential course that you might want to get on or indeed when you want to become a teacher. So there we go, that, that's me, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert, particularly about this upbeat message that I think is very much needed um, in these times where um, uh, for, variety, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, students before they graduate really worry what's the future gonna hope for them. And I think um, teaching um, is something that in a sense with all the changes we're currently facing will always be around in one form or the other. And where a lot of you will be able to do what you are really passionate about. And I think, I think if, if, if anything, that is something that one should consider uh, when it comes to their professional choices. Um, before we open this up um, uh, for, for um, general questions um, that you might have, I just want to uh, come back to, to Rachel, Becky and Anna Maria. Um, and as you are um, fairly early in your teaching career or just about to get there, um, and yet you've talked so passionately about um, the experiences that you've already made. I'm wondering personally, almost kind of from an emotional point of view, what is it that you like about uh, uh, teaching? Um, Becky, for example, um, when we talked about this uh, in preparation for, um, uh, for this webinar today, I had the feeling it almost felt like a like a calling <laughs> for you. Is that, is that true? Uh, what is it that you like about um, your experience um, as, a, as a teaching assistant, um, um, you know, the, the, the insights that you've had so far. Um, what is it that you find fascinating? I think like the biggest reward of teaching is just being able to see your kids progress and like almost that like eureka moment when you can literally watch them and they go, I understand that now, thank you. I think that's probably like you've spent a while working with them you know the kids quite well and then they all of a sudden just something clicks that they haven't understood before and you just like you look back from so when I left in March compared to like their level in October and they're just it's not like a massive improvement because you're not going to become fluent overnight but you still see that improvement and you just go wow like those kids have really worked hard um I feel like it's just like quite humbling to know that what you're doing is actually helping someone else. I just, yeah, I think that's probably the like best feeling about 
what I've done so far. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Maria and Rachel, is there anything that you would like to add to this? Um, not really. I'm kind of doing it for the same reason. So it was literally everything that Becky just said. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, probably for uh, Robert, Gloria, VC and me, uh, I mean, we've all made that choice to teach in, in, in one way or, or the other. And I can, I can definitely um, um, uh, uh, um, understand what Becky is saying, this idea, not just um, about it being rewarding, but also see that you create something or you inspire someone uh, um, um, uh, to grow and then you see the result every day, um, ideally. And yeah, I, 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 it is something um, that keeps you going every day, even if it's challenging, even if you need a lot of energy, even if it can be frustrating uh, sometimes. Uh, Rachel, was there anything that you wanted to add? Um, I don't think so no I think also with um a foreign language it's kind of demotivating I mean it's very you have to be very careful in correcting I find people because if you do it I mean from my own personal experience in in GCSE and in A level if if you're told you're doing something wrong I feel like in a language it's so much more it hurts more <laughs> if someone tells you you've done maths wrong you're like whatever but if someone tells you you've said something wrong you're like oh that like it hurts kind of in a way. So I feel like learning to do that and seeing um, them take criticism better at uh, kind of them wanting to improve as well, not just them actually improving. I feel like that's quite, uh, it's nice to see that in, in the students as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and perhaps also something that you, you said there, um, this idea of when you're studying or teaching languages, you're always involved with your whole personality. It's not just kind of like, you know, the business side of yourself or um, I don't know, um, whatever profession um, um, it is that you do. Um, it is always about you as your whole person, which can be challenging, but also yeah. um, amazingly rewarding. Yeah. Um, uh, Vicia and Gloria, um, I was uh, thinking, uh, while we are talking about careers um, in teaching and how to become a language teacher, um, the talk is also often about transferable skills. Um, so the idea that um, what students do when they train to become a teacher or they learn about teaching is something that they can benefit from um, in, in a range of, of, of different professions. And I was thinking from the modules that you're teaching, is there anything in particular that you think that can be beneficial, even if students at a point decide not to become language teachers, but something completely different? Um, so I would say communication skills, you know, it's, it's one of the things that uh, we develop. Um, and as a language teacher, you have to be able to communicate. Um, you have to be able to put yourself in front of a group of students and speak up and do presentations and so on. And I think that applies to um, all careers, um, really. Um, we do written assignments, which again, you know, uh, applies to other careers. Um, what we do in particular with our modules, we focus on English language teaching, but it also applies to teaching in general. It doesn't really have to be English or languages. You can apply what we when we talk about it and, and what we um, discuss to other kinds of teaching. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Visya, your thoughts on this? I will give you an anecdote because it is easier. I am myself a graduate of languages. I have a joint honors degree in English and French. And when I left university, I knew that I wanted to do a PhD eventually, but I needed a break. Um, so I went abroad uh, to better my English, but to do that, I needed a job, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I found this job in a very posh jewelry shop in a very posh um, shopping center thing in Dublin. And uh, my skills acquired during my degree because I hadn't worked before really. I had worked in a children's camp, of course, but most of my skills had come from my degree. So organizational skills, language skills, patient skills, 
resilience, a lot of resilience and, uh, you know, standing up in front of people and talking, all those things, speaking in English, trying to sell things in English, etc., came in very, very handy. And within a year, I was nominated for Best Employee of the Year and I was put on a fast track for a managerial position. That's when I left because I thought to myself, I'm going to get a lot of money here and I'm going to see my paycheck and I'm going to rethink my entire uh, future. So before I see that paycheck, I need to go back to studying because that's what I want to do. That's what I've always wanted to do since I was 10. So I'm not uh, geopardizing my dreams for a paycheck, but let's not see the paycheck. So I left. But that's just to say that the first job that I landed after my uh, joint honors degree in modern languages put me on a fast track to a managerial position. And that's just one example, but I could have done anything really yeah. because yeah. I had learned to be resilient and communicative and uh, organized and creative. That's another thing. So that's just me, but it's not me. I'm not that special. You know, it is it is the world of, of languages and what it unlocks for you in terms of skills and uh, possibilities. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess one of the key words here is, is leadership. Um, um, uh, perhaps something that um, when you're training to become a teacher, you're not always aware of, but you are already leading a team. A group of students is a very complex entity, um, very much like, like teams in any kind of managerial position, like, like Missia mentioned. And to work with that group and kind of um, work with the dynamics that are going on in a group like that, that requires a lot of the skills and trains a lot of the skills that you will need in, in any kind of managing position. And my last question, perhaps, um, uh, back to Robert. Um, uh, you saw, um, um, uh, uh, fascinatingly talked about um, what your days look like and you know all the challenges but also um, how much um, uh, you like your job how rewarding it is um, um, and I'm wondering for you was there ever a point um, in your career or perhaps um, in studying towards your uh, PGCE when you knew that this was the right path to go? Because, I mean, what I hear from a lot of our students and then even graduates, it's one of the biggest challenges. And I, I remember that from my own life, of course, um, uh, is how do you know what's right for you? What kind of career is the right path for you? Um, mm. Have you had any doubts? And have you had any points where you knew it was right? It's a really good question, actually. Um, I, I was one of those people, I, well, I had a really clear idea for a long time that I wanted to be a teacher. But I, oddly enough, that was probably best confirmed when I was taking the languages in the classroom module, uh, when it was quite a funny moment, actually. The school that I was in, the, there was, it, was a, it was a cover lesson. And you, you, let's, let's just say that student behaviour during cover lessons isn't always the prettiest. Um, so I, I, I was, no cover teacher had appeared, but I was in the room. And I was able, with this particular school, to leave probably about the first 15, 20 minutes off the top of my head. And it was so enjoyable. And it stuck with me for such a long time. And then obviously that member of staff arrived and, and that was all fine. And we sort of collaborated and, and that was really good. It, it really stuck in my mind that this was the thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to have those interactions, the humour, the fun, the, the, the benefit of what language teaching brought. Um, and, and you do see students develop such amazing skills incredibly quickly. Um, and in terms of uh, me maintaining my love of languages, I think uh, it's, it, that's very easy. And actually, I, I feel like actually teaching is the best way to learn as well. Um, in not just my pedagogical experience, but also my knowledge of the language. You'll inevitably have one or two students who might speak that language fluently, who will just give you a nudge in the right direction if your verb endings are wrong. Um, but you know, that's always really good. But also for me, the constant um, reflective practice in teaching and the, the, the way that a lot of schools nowadays want to use research-based materials uh, means that it's constantly evolving. 
you constantly want to improve. You work on what students are telling you. And that keeps me motivated. For, it's not just that I'm teaching, you know, how to say at what time I get up every year. I might have taught it four different ways and I might teach it slightly better next year again. So that is a really, really healthy way to keep you interested in, in, in what can seem like quite monotonous, but it's never quite the same each year we approach it like that. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. I, I can very much identify um, with feeling um, as a learner while you teach, and, and Rachel and Becky, who are both uh, teaching in the final year language module, they can probably um, 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 uh, spot, uh, remember the many times when, when, when I wasn't really sure and someone else had to help me out with my German grammar, although I'm a native speaker. Well, um, yes, um, I'm sure there is um, a, a lot of uh, questions, comments, um, uh, things that you would like to talk about. Um, so please don't be shy. Um, you can turn on your microphone and, and tell us uh, your question or your comment, um, or just uh, use the chat. So if nobody wants to turn on their microphone just now, um, I'll just uh, wait for comments to pop up um, in the chat. And in the meantime, um, perhaps back to Rachel, Anna Maria and Becky. When, so you, you, you're teaching and at the same time, you are students at various stages. Do you feel that um, your own teaching or mentoring or being a teaching assistant, did that have an effect on your own learning? Did it influence the way that you look at yourself when you're a student in the classroom? Well, I think one of the biggest things, especially this year, um, just like teaching in general, it really makes me sympathize with the teachers when sometimes <laughs> you're in a seminar and no one answers. Um, and knowing that like if I was in the teacher's position I'd feel really awkward so I always try and just be a bit like more proactive because I just it's really really awkward to sit there and in front of a class and no one answers so in that sense it, I definitely sympathize a lot especially mm -hmm. this year with technology because it's much much harder yeah yeah I have the same this year with the mentoring because I sit there and I ask a question and there's two or three mentorees on the screen and they, they're just blank faces and it's just like oh I spent so long picking this topic and I know it's interesting so just say something so I'm exactly the same in my own seminars I try and in, kind of engage as much as I can yeah yeah and I um, again I can attest to that um, um I've uh, uh, definitely had a very active final year group um, um, uh, this year. Um, and there is a question in the chat from uh, Megan. Um, Megan asks, how do you deal with feeling like an imposter? Um, I've wanted to teach for a long time now, but I'm constantly aware that I'm not French or German and the majority of language teachers are native speakers. Um, but perhaps this might be a question to you, Robert, or Vicia and Gloria. Um, um, but Robert, you're not a native speaker of French or Spanish either, are you? No, I'm not. No, I'm very lucky that in my school, I actually teach both up to A level. And that is on the back of my University of Kent degree only. Um, I can assure, I often say this to my students, actually, as well. It's an issue that, um, I, I, that comes up, you know, so we get some students, which is slightly different, but for students who can't go to foreign languages, foreign countries, they can't afford it. I often tell them I've never been to Spain before the age of 17 because my father wouldn't fly in a plane and he was the one who'd buy the tickets. Um, so what I'd say is that if you know what you are doing in that lesson and you, you've studied that language, you deliver what you've got with confidence. Um, there will be topics, especially when I get to year 13 and I'm, I'm in a room with people we're talking about really, really complex things. I will have a dictionary at my side or I will have wordreference.com open and I'll be very honest and say, look, I don't know that. Let's look it up. And what I always say to my students is I can give you, for example, the exam skills. I can give you the how to learn a language because I've had to go through that process. I'm never gonna beat my Spanish colleague. I'm never gonna beat my French colleague in knowledge, but what I can offer them is a slightly different perspective on the learning process. 
where it's others and we it, a lot of team teaching happens by a level and you'll get people having classes on culture with 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 sir next door and then with me they'll come and do exam skills um so i honestly megan i absolutely encourage you to go for it because um there are loads i promise you there's loads of english speaking or you know english native um foreign languages teachers who you know we try our best we're not perfect but deliver what you know with confidence that's why i say Brilliant. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Lucia and Gloria, anything that you would add to this? And in the meantime, please still feel free to add any questions or comments uh, to the chat. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think this idea of native speakers having to teach the language that they speak, um, or that they're the better teachers, is really a misconception and a myth. Um, so because you are a native speaker of a language, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you are able to teach it. Um, so for those of you who are not native speakers, but have had the training, um, you are equipped to teach the language. And um, as Robert was saying, you will have a different perspective. So you may not have those native intuitions, which I think is why you feel that you, know, you, you lack the knowledge, but you do have uh, the experience. So you've been a learner yourself of, of that language. So you can teach your learners techniques that you have used yourself to learn the language, um, you know, you can actually predict where difficulties may arise for those learners because you you are able to speak of that language and you've been in that situation yourself. Um, you, you've been in those shoes, so you may be more supportive in that sense as well. So yes, native speakers have those native intuitions, but if they have not had the training to be teachers, um, you have that upper hand, you've been in, in those shoes before. So I feel like you should not feel like an imposter. Um, if you have proficiency in the language and you have the training, um, you can definitely be even a better teacher than a native speaker um, themselves. So that's my take on it. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, uh, I mean, uh, and, and perhaps I, 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 I add something from my own perspective as a teacher of my native language. Um, I always feel the other way around. I feel like an imposter sometimes because I am teaching students who have spent much more time studying the German grammar than I have, who know a lot of the different patterns and uh, um, 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 uh, grammar topics way better than I do. I just happen to be able to um, form some correct sentences intuitively, um, but that doesn't necessarily make me a very good teacher, I hope. I think, I think ideally, probably, you learn a language in an environment where you are exposed to native and non-native speakers um, and speakers of your own first language. And, 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 and then through these different angles, um, I, I, I'm one of my colleagues, Ian uh, Cooper, who I share a lot of the language modules with, and he usually teaches translation, for example, um, which is something that is really difficult for me because um, that bilingual thinking is just not something that I can um, easily operate with. And, 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 and it's probably just that different people with different backgrounds bring very different strengths to the table. And as long as we focus on our strengths, that's probably much more helpful um, for our teaching than, than being too caught up by the, by the weaknesses. But there is another question from uh, Lucy. Lucy asked, is there any opportunities in your career studies that you wish you had done to improve your CVs and your fluency? Um, yeah, any, any comments from anyone, I guess, uh, about this? Anything that you, looking back, would have done or done differently? Anything that can help to um, improve your CVs when you want to become a teacher? Vicia? Yeah, um, I speak uh, French more or less at intermediate level. That varies depending on how much I get to practice it during the year. And uh, when I did my BA, I didn't have the chance to go uh, on my year abroad to France because I had to choose. I majored in English and my manner was French. So I wish I had spent some time in France. So um, I, I, I will do that at some point, but I wish I had done that before because I would have consolidated my language skills in French. I don't think it would have improved my CV, but I am a very uh, proud person. 
And uh, in general, I think uh, it would have perhaps opened even more doors. Um, although when you have more than two languages on your CV, really, it's it's a lot. Um, especially in the United Kingdom, if I may add this note, uh, I, I'm not uh, making any further comment on this. But uh, so more time abroad uh, to improve my French. Yes. Can I just add that um, in general, I would just say get as much experience as you can. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's paid or not paid. Sometimes to get the first paid position, you have to maybe do some volunteering and there are a lot of opportunities out there. So my um, suggestion to improve your CV and get, um, you know, probably the better chance to get a, a job is get as many teaching opportunities as you can. Um, so just look for them and, and get anything that you can, uh, you can, you can that's going to help a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you both. Um, um, I wanted to pick something up that, that Robert had said about contacts and that's probably just underlining what, what Gloria has just said. Um, um, it's, it's a bit of shameless uh, promotion of the online mentoring scheme to um, everyone here who is currently a languages student um, at the University of Kent. Uh, but what I've seen is once you get in touch with decision makers around language teaching, and that can be um, language teachers that you work for during your year abroad or work with, that can be teachers um, at schools here, you have your foot in the door. And from there on, you'll always have people who can, um, if not to hire you directly, but perhaps give very valuable advice, um, tell you how things work, um, introduce you um, um, to other people. Um, so I, I, I guess it's really contacts um, as in any other professional um, area play a big role in language teaching as well. Um, though um, as a, um, as a student of uh, linguistics or languages, um, you have this great opportunity already as either part of your degree or in your spare time to volunteer and, and, and get a little bit of teaching experience, but also get those, those very important contacts. Robert, how much were contacts important for your career, if I might ask, for, for the places that you're in now? Yeah, I, th I think they were. I mean, it certainly makes life easier. For example, um, applying for a position, say, in a grammar school, they're quite coveted um, because of how they are, you know, grammar schools are perceived as, you know, um, it's like, you know, let's say, and the, the environment is a, a, a little bit more academic as well. Although that's not to say that other schools don't have amazing A-level and GCSE courses. Um, obviously, we have ours as compulsory, whereas some, some, uh, some schools and, and it becomes like a specific subject, a bit like music, and it's an option. Um, I'd say contacts, what contacts are useful for is getting a foot in the door in the first place and being able to gain that experience. Um, in terms of getting a job, um, I'd say that teaching is a pretty level playing field once you enter into the job market, especially because the language teachers are so sought after. The only competition you're going to really have is the people who are, you know, once they've narrowed down the list, you've just got to perform really well on that interview day. But what makes the difference initially is your understanding of what teaching is. So if, you, if you're going to build contacts, you're going to build those contacts to help you know what is involved that you don't turn up on day one of a PGC and go, what the hell have I done? <laughs> so, which doesn't happen because people make those contacts. Uh, you know, you have to be fully aware of what your what's what you know, the commitment and the and the enthusiasm that you need. And I think as linguists we have that anyway, because it takes an awful lot to go on a year abroad because it takes a huge amount. To, to stay the course and, and commit yourself to a language uh, in the way that we've all done. Obviously, that's why we're, why we're here now. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, there's another question, um, probably for Robert. Do you feel that your language skills have stagnated at all since teaching as the level is much lower than at university or abroad? It's a really, really interesting question. Um, obviously, there's two sides of the coin. Yes, I know reflexive verbs really well because I teach it year eight at least three times a week in turn one. However, what is so fascinating for me is because every language department will be a multicultural space, I have had more contact with uh, Spanish speakers and French speakers 
um, now than I than I did uh, for many years. Obviously, I'm lucky when I was at Kent to have that same. So it actually continues. I speak to my colleague who I also consider to be a friend every day in in French and Spanish, and that's all members of the department. So my and also teaching A level, you need to know your stuff. You need to know that technical higher level stuff because the new specifications were designed to prepare students for higher level study. They do a, an independent research project where you have to know how to offer them evaluative and analytical language. Um, you know what you know better, and there are themes that come up as common themes that will are normal for children to know and young adults to know. But I would definitely say, I raise my level of language or make, certainly try and maintain it through normal human contact language, uh, attending forums, etc., and speaking with colleagues and, and, and people at school who do speak other languages. So it, it might not be literally how you think, but in the classroom, teaching regular present tense verbs might get repetitive, but it might be through other means that you can maintain that language as well. Mm, amazing, amazing. Thank you. Well, if there isn't any final questions, either by the microphone or the chat, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone um, for participating today. Most of all, um, uh, your, our speakers um, uh, for sharing your insights and your experience. Um, it was really, really um, um, uh, interesting to see all the different uh, perspectives on, on our shared uh, topics. Hear so much about um, your various um, experiences. Um, yeah, um, if uh, there is anything that any of uh, the members of the audience would like uh, to know about uh, teaching or about studying at the University of Kent, please do get in touch with us. Um, and yeah, in terms of contacts, I, I, I see a few emails going your way, Robert, tomorrow, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but thanks very much um, for sharing um, uh, today. And yes, um, have a great evening. Thanks very much for being here today. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.